Luan. <laughs> I'm a virgin! <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome back to the Koth Corner and happy Valentine's Day. Today we're going to discuss a pair of episodes that have been floating in my mind for quite some time. And given this holiday subject, I think it's the perfect time to discuss. The episodes on the docket today are Season 2's I Remember Mono and Season 5's episode Luan Virgin 2.0. Besides the fact that these episodes' subject matter has to do with romance, the bigger tie between these two deals with the topic of lying to your spouse for a long time and how such a lie is dealt with in the present day. The first episode we'll dissect is I Remember Mono. The episode starts with Bobby making a Valentine's Day card for his friend, Joseph. Happy Valentine's Day, Joseph? Love, Bobby? Hey, hot stuff? Bobby, you can't give this to Joseph. Why not? He is hot stuff. You should see him skateboard. Bobby, if you give a valentine to a sixth grade boy, girls are gonna think you're sensitive. Uh, yeah, Hank, you ever think that's why Bobby didn't really have a lot of trouble getting girls? Or maybe Bobby's just a good enough friend to think about his best friend and wanted to do something nice for him. Bobby's alright. Hank is obviously not down with the romantic inclination of the card, so he tosses it into the garbage. Luann picks it up and decides that she'll give the card to herself since her boyfriend, Buckley, says he'll forget Valentine's Day that year. Again. This implies she's been with Buckley for at least two Valentine's Days, but in the previous season it was only three weeks? Or is that just how Hank and Peggy saw it because he barely treated her like a girlfriend? I'm willing to bet it's the latter. Anyway, Luann drops this wisdom. I finally made myself realize that to love yourself, that's the greatest love of all. And the hills shut it down. Mm, no. No, that's not really true at all, in fact. I don't know if that's just a terrible thing to say or a hard truth. You should learn to love yourself so you don't fall for people that treat you like garbage because you think you don't deserve better. But you shouldn't only love yourself because that makes you a narcissist unable to love anyone but yourself. I don't think it's meant to be that deep. But moving on, Peggy asks if Luann wants to hear the story of how she and Hank fell in love. You know, after shooting her down for her loving herself revelation. You can see Hank visibly uncomfortable with the idea. Let's put a pin in that because that will be relevant later. The story goes that while Hank and Peggy were in high school, Hank brings up to Peggy that some of the guys on his football team were going to have dinner cooked for them by their girlfriends. Hank clumsily asks if Peggy could do the same, to which she agrees. However, she takes it upon herself to make a very complicated spread. Peggy, you are not trying to make that right. Beef Wellington. Cherry pie? Why not just build him a rocket ship? Just a quick note here, folks, if you're planning on taking up cooking or wanting to make a nice meal for someone, be realistic with your expectations if you're a novice. Start with something simple, not something like Beef Wellington that involves several steps. Moving on, Peggy's mother tells her that if Hank discovers she can't cook, their relationship prospects are finished. Which strikes me as odd because Peggy is only, what, 17, 18 at this point? I don't find it terribly realistic that she would or should be responsible for cooking in the household, especially since this iteration of Peggy's mother implies she's a homemaker and likely does all the cooking anyway. So yeah, another unrealistic expectation from both Peggy's mom and Hank. When would a student that's active in sports that has a cooking mother at home be expected to learn how to cook? Well anyway, Peggy messes up the meal and is crying at the dinner table believing she'll lose Hank forever. She gets a call from Hank who tells her that he threw out his back and can't make it to dinner. I made beef wellington. Really? Is that steak? Yes, sir. And I made a cherry pie. And a blueberry pie. Wow, Peggy, I love both those pies. And Hank and Peggy reflect that Hank throwing his back out saved their relationship because her lack of cooking wasn't known to Hank. Luann takes this story to heart and says... So I guess what they say is true. There is somebody out there for everybody. Huh? No, I don't think that follows at all, Luann. Nope, not for everybody. Uh-uh. Okay, Hank's response makes a little bit more sense here. That wasn't really the point of their story. The point of their story is that women in the 70s better have known how to cook or they'd get dumped. So later on, Peggy has a stint at the high school substituting for the record keeper. 
Hmm, that's an odd position to have a substitute for. If the record keeper is out, then they can just pick up the work when they return, can't they? Unless there's a deadline? Whatever. But either way, Peggy comes across Hank's old school records and discovers his two-week absence his senior year. She tells her colleague about his back injury, but she is corrected, being told that he had mono, a disease that is most commonly spread via kissing. Becky, I never had mono in my entire life. Ooh. I'd have had the same reaction, Becky. So Peggy confronts Hank about it, apparently not asking how Hank got mono back then. He says he got it sharing a soda with someone, and Peggy apparently covered her bases. That's funny. You know, on the way out of the building, I stopped by the school nurse's office. She did not mention that you could get mono that way. But Dale pulls a bro moment and covers for him. Uh, well, I wouldn't put too much stock in what that woman said, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which seems to satisfy Peggy in the moment, but this also confirms that Dale knew the truth as well. The next day, Peggy laments that the mono discovery has been bothering her. The assistant admits the same and did some digging on her own time, showing Peggy that there was no one else on the football team that had mono. In fact, only one person in their records had mono at the same time, which turns out to be a female. Hmm, okay, then who did she get it from if no one else at the school had it? This connection is flimsy at best, but for the sake of the plot, let's keep plowing through. So the whore played well with others, did she? Damn, Peggy! I only remember one other instance off the top of my head where the word whore was used in the show. Shut down this whore house! Peggy discusses the discovery with Nancy, trying to explain away the illness. Nancy tells her it's unlikely, but also that it's best to just leave it alone. Peggy won't take this and eventually tracks down the other woman to find out the truth. The woman, Amy, seems to be okay with some strange woman asking about a simple kiss decades ago, but she matter-of-factly tells Peggy the entire story. She had just broken up with her boyfriend, the one I can only presume gave her mono, and was just out to find any guy that would kiss her. Hank, being the gentleman that he is, rebuffs her, but she kisses him anyway. Maybe it's just me, but it doesn't seem like he pushed her off right away. I don't know if it's due to the fact that he was enjoying it, I mean look here, he's holding her, or if he was just uncomfortable shoving a woman in any capacity at first. But regardless, Amy apologizes and Peggy seems satisfied with this explanation, but now she has pretext to be upset with something else. Peggy confronts Hank about it and he finally comes clean. Okay, it's true. I did lie. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. oh. Oh, it feels great to get that off my chest. Give me a hug. I've never felt closer to you. Back off, mister. I do not feel close to you. But Peggy isn't about to let it go that easily. Peggy tells him she can forgive the kissing and even the lie to cover it up, but she can't get over the fact that their romantic background was effectively built on something that was made up. I don't think Peggy's train of thought here is unreasonable. It was essentially a story of everything happens for a reason, and while the outcome would have been the same if he had just told the truth, Peggy's romantic identity with Hank is effectively becoming unraveled. If this facet of their relationship was turned upside down, what else isn't true? Things that have been believed to be buried for such a long time coming to light, no matter how small, can mess with someone, especially if it's from someone they love and trust. And since the revelation angered Peggy enough to punch a carcass, they now have a bunch of beef, which is humorously expanded upon briefly in the next scene. I guess this would be a good time to mention the side plot that involves Bobby thinking Carrie Strug sent him a secret love letter. Me being a huge gymnastics fan, this bit always made me giddy because they got Carrie Strug to voice herself. It's compulsory that you be my valentine. That sounds like it took a lot of takes. It doesn't have any real bearing on the main plot, just gives a few humorous scenes and opens the door for Connie and Bobby to have a relationship later on. Since the truth came out, Peggy begins moping about the house and becomes short with Hank. Hank, of course, notices, and Dale suggests he do something romantic. The guys provide a few ideas. Yeah, I'll tell you something I saw in the movie one time. See, this pig got loose in this couple's house, and they chased it around until they fell on top of each other, and they were laughing and giggling and loving. And Hank, bless his heart, tries to produce a scenario where he can be thoughtful, but only ends up making it worse. Isn't 
that the jacket that I made for you? Uh... You said that gang stole that jacket because it was the wrong color. Huh. Guess who? <laughs> oh! oh! You have gasoline on your hands? Yeah, I was cleaning tar off the driveway. Oof. And that's another lie against you, Hank. So Hank releases a pig in the house so they can try catching it together. That's dang cute. But Peggy isn't amused as she rightfully points out you can't manufacture such things, they just happen. While they discuss this, the pig comes in and trips Hank, causing him to fall down and hurt his back. Oh, and it turns out Bobby's secret admirer is his grandmother. Grandma? Happy Valentine's Day, boo-boo. No! <laughs> Your grandmother loves you. Okay, well, that's the end of that. Peggy talks to her girlfriends about the situation, mentioning the other gestures Hank has done for her. Mm-hmm. Then he actually drank a whole bottle of champagne out of one of my pumps. My charcoal pads filtered out most of the alcohol, but he still got tipsy enough to sing a Chuck Mangione song. What? Why didn't we get to see that? That would have been awesome! Drunk Hank singing is always a treat. Happy anniversary, baby. Got you on my... Find. You've got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. Anyway, Peggy continues to talk about Hank's gestures and starts seeing the humor in them. You know, you could write that story down, put Fabio on the cover, and sell it at the airport. Available at Dallas Lovefield Airport now. Peggy then realizes that Hank's intentions, while misguided and brought upon by something he was trying to make right, were sweet and thoughtful. With the help of her friends, the two reenact their Valentine's Day story in the present day, and the two are seen in the bedroom smiling, indicating that Peggy has forgiven him. The end. This episode deals with the issue of someone believing that just because a lie was laid down a long time ago that it isn't as relevant in the present day, which I find to be silly. Like, if I find out my friend back in the 8th grade wasn't really sick, he just didn't want to go to the movies with me on a certain day, that's not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. However, I would be miffed that a friend of mine was comfortable enough lying to me, even if it was such a small instance. I would be appreciative if he came clean, but if I found out about it, that's a different story. Just my take. Now let's move on to a more controversial episode, Season 5's Luann Virgin 2.0. I say controversial because this episode's subject matter deals with the ideas of quote-unquote purity and superficial characteristics that speak to someone's character in the context of religion and society. But thankfully, I won't be discussing such in this video. This video is about lying, not societal worth. If you want to listen to such discussions, listen to the Whatever Podcast and bid some of your brain cells farewell. This episode starts with the most Hank Hill thing ever, looking at a picture of their trip to the new hardware store. We also get this hilarious sight gag. Huh, so we can't blame the red eyes on the flash. Since Luann is dating this winner, she can use the employee discount, but unfortunately for Luann... No hard feelings, but it's over, Linda. Oh, I'm sorry. Unfortunately for Linda... Honey, he just broke up with you. You know, Linda, for what it's worth, at least he broke up with you to your face and didn't ghost you for days. I may or may not be speaking from experience. Mostly may. So on the way home, Luann is lamenting at her newly single status. But hey, at least she's dating again. She's not holding a candle for Buckley as implied in the previous season, and is attempting to move on. You go, girl. See, if Zach had told me he was going to act like such a butt, I would have never slept with him. Yeah, it's pretty nice when they tell you these things up front, like how they're going to forget Valentine's Day. So that means you're not- Like Hank, I quit being a virgin the first time I had sex. Wow, on the first try? Luann lists off the men she slept with, saying she thought they liked her, but... Well, that doesn't seem to be the case, because where are all of them now? Well, except Buckley. So Hank takes her to church for an emergency... Churching? And the Reverend confirms that Luann has indeed sinned. But if young people like Luann didn't sin, I'd be out of a job. <laughs> uh, anyway... I don't understand how someone as Jesus-focused as Luann wouldn't know that to begin with. But Reverend Stroop tells Luann that there's a way to restore her purity. Mm -hmm. She's listening. Notice how Peggy jumped on that. That'll be important later. 
Luann can become a born-again virgin if she abstains from sex until she's married and logs in some youth community service time. Wow, that's very Catholic of them. Hank and Peggy accept the role of her sponsors and participate in the activities of the secondary virginity program. Who's ready to engage in a frank and open discussion of fornication? When my kids are teenagers, I'm going to say this at the dinner table with no provocation and see what they do. Now, let's break into male and female discussion groups and share our detailed sexual histories. I'll say that too and see if that gets them bolting from the table. So Hank is in the male discussion group and the group lead starts it off by testifying he's had four partners and was so close to a fifth. Hank is next and tells the story of how Peggy was insistent that they wait for marriage. So his tally is currently at one. Then a young man named Rhett, voiced by Owen Wilson, is asked to go next. And when he starts getting into the details, it's revealed he blew his load while getting a massage at an arts and crafts fair. And then I, and then I send my pants. That must have been hella awkward when he stood up. He also seems torn up about it, saying he hates himself, indicating some deep repression in his life. But anyway, he's still a virgin, so he needs to vacate the premises. In the female group, the ladies are given a Hershey kiss for each partner they've had. Luann is concerned as she is the youngest person there, but has already had four partners. When it comes to Peggy, she says one. But Reverend Stroop's praise for her commitment jostles Peggy into admitting the truth. For you. Two. I'm sorry? I would like one more chocolate, please. Are you hungry, hun? No. I slept with another man before I met my husband. Peggy opens up to Luann about the other man, who was her best male friend at the time. He told her he thought he might be gay, so in order to find out... So, we went back to Wayne's house, gently pushed aside his decorative throw pillows, and then... Oh, yeah. Did you fix him? Oh, no, Luann. He was not broken. Just gay. Very, very gay. I do appreciate that the show made it clear there wasn't something wrong with the friend because he was gay, and the characters don't see it that way either, nor do they consider it something that can be cured. Later on, the virgin ceremony is commencing, and it mirrors something like a baptism. And Hank tells those frisbee chads to back off. Okay, everyone who hasn't had premarital sex gets ice cream. Well, no ice cream for you then, Peggy. And as in the mono episode, Peggy goes to Nancy to talk about it. Very interesting person to go to about keeping secrets about sexual relationships. She advises Peggy to not tell him, but she's visibly upset at the whole thing. She clearly knows Hank believed her to be a virgin when they got together, even if it wasn't outright stated. We'll have more on that later. In the next scene, Luann is reaching out to the youth per her virginity pledge. Your virginity is in danger now! You need to sign this abstinence pledge card before you discover how wonderful sex feels. Keep talking. Great job, Luann. Back at the house, Hank mentions... When we were 18, we were already married. If we'd had to wait any longer, who knows what kind of trouble we would have gotten into. Okay, let's dissect this little bit of continuity muck up. Hank says that they were 18 when they were married, but in season one, Peggy says she never kissed a man until she was 20, and that he's now dead. So I take it Hank and Peggy skipped the whole kissing thing and went straight to the sex for at least two years. Yeah, I'll go with that. I mean, I don't see them locking lips in their wedding photo. Also, how old was Peggy when she had sex then? Let's give some courtesy leeway of Hank and Peggy's courtship when they were in high school. Peggy says they were dating for six months before the Valentine's Day episode, where they became engaged to be engaged. Sure, I'll buy it. My parents were only dating for six months before they got engaged. So let's say they're about 16 or 17. And if she was with Wayne before she even met Hank, then perhaps she was 16 or even younger. Then did she just skip the kissing with Wayne and go straight to the sex with him too? Dang, Peggy, what the heck was in that flower book? During this discussion, Hank suggests they fix Luann up with a like-minded, virginity-obsessed man, so Hank won't be saddled up with watching Luann's kids. So they fix her up with Rhett. I saw you at the virgin thing. 
I, I got kicked out for already being one. You want a bowl? It's totally not a sin. Okay. Such a deliciously awkward exchange. But hey, it works and the two start hitting it off. Then there's this brief scene where Bobby tries to sign up Boomhauer to take the virginity pledge. I think he'd have better luck turning Hank from Texas's Whataburger to California's In-N-Out. Now we're at the night of the abstinence dance and there's quite a lot of people there. I don't know how regular these things are, but apparently the turnout is pretty high. I also enjoy the juxtapositioning of the swing music to the wait for your spouse message. Also, Bobby and Connie make one heck of a dancing team. Well, look at Bobby. I think he has finally found his spot. Oh. Hank, do you not realize how freaking shredded dancers are? Red starts getting hot and bothered while dancing close to Luann while she talks about sex. Did you know that the changing table at Whataburger is strong enough to hold up one person but not two? Uh, maybe it's because changing tables are made for children that weigh less than 50 pounds. Anyway, after being put in a provocative position, Rhett finally succumbs to the horny and asks Luann to marry him. I wonder if he sinned in his pants then, too. She's ecstatic and excitedly tells the hills. Hank reminds her that they just met and that this isn't a Disney movie. M may I give you a little preview of your wedding? Does anyone object? Yes, I do. And who are you? Peggy Hill! Luann takes offense to how Peggy objects to the union and says she'll be the first woman in the family to be wed as a virgin. You watch it, young lady. Your aunt and I never- No, no, no. Before she met you. With Wayne Trotter. Dirty pool, Luann. Dirty pool. Well, it's true. <laughs> He's gay now, if, if that makes you feel any better. <laughs> when I was younger, I thought Hank's second bois there was because he was afraid Peggy would turn him gay or something. Ah, memories. So aside from the fact Luann needs a good smackdown telling Peggy's business to Hank, Hank is packing his bags to leave temporarily. You're the one who is always saying we should wait. Well, it's easy to wait on dinner when you've already had a little snack, isn't it, Peggy? Oh, Hank, she had a snack, all right. <laughs> well, 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 you never told me about all your, your wild escapades when you worked at Jeans West. <sighs> I told you about the time I put on the gigantic pair of khakis and pretended I was tiny. I was very upfront about it. I wish we could have gotten more on that. Peggy insists that she is remorseful, but explains that her past actions aren't as important as what Luann is trying to do in the present day. Hank leaves anyway. I'm going to Luann's. I think it's best if you stay here and think about what you did and what I didn't get to do. Like what? Eating cream of beef wellington cherry pie? Also, what difference does it make if he didn't get to do it back then? The two of them seem to have a pretty happy, healthy sex life in the present day anyway. Moving on, Luann is trying on wedding dresses and modeling them for Hank and Rhett. The guy at the rental place said that most of the girls who have worn this dress are still married. How would... How would a rental place know if they're still married? Is the turnover as fast as them returning the dress? She sees Peggy giving her a stern look and considers if she should invite her to the wedding. Peggy begs her to call it off, but she insists she will continue. Nothing you can say can stop me from becoming Mrs. Red Platter. Yes, I am keeping my last name. See, I was afraid I wouldn't like your last name. It's Vandergraaff. Oh, I love it! <laughs> I'm going to be Mrs. Red Vandergraaff. I'm going to be Mrs. Red Vandergraaff. The Vandergraffs. Hank seems to be on board with the wedding even more so in the wake of finding out what Peggy did. Hank, will you stop this? What is it you want from me? An apology? Fine. I am sorry. Very, very sorry. I have made a horrible mistake and I have paid the price. How much longer are you going to punish me? Peggy, you're one to talk. In the Valentine's Day episode, you moped about the house and were hostile to Hank for days. Hank's been gone only a single night, I think. I do think Peggy has a bit more reason to push back, seeing as how she's more concerned about Luann and her hasty marriage than Hank's anger. If you'll excuse me, I've got to go tell Boomhauer we'll need his limo for the wedding this weekend. Boomhauer has a limo? Couple that with a human gyroscope and a hot tub, Boomhauer sure has a lot of neat stuff. 
That night, Peggy sees Luann sneaking outside of her own house to hook up with Rhett in the back of his van. She calls Hank and... Okay, I'm amused at the fact that she has a label for the speed dial specifically for Hank at Luann's house. So did they install a private line just for that weird mouth phone? Maybe he was there for more than a couple of days? Or do they just want to fill in all of the spaces? But if that's Luann's house anyway, why doesn't it just say Luann? There's so many inferences to be made here. Hank and Peggy find Rhett and Luann and break them apart with the fire extinguisher. Did they not notice him open the door and shout hey a few times? Well, at least he was nice enough to throw it back into Luann's yard. I'm so sorry, Mr. Hill. Uh, I've waited 22 years. I couldn't wait another week. You're 22? Hank decides the wedding is tomorrow because it's going to be difficult to break them apart in the meantime, which should speak volumes to how silly this whole thing is. Peggy imparts some pretty good words of wisdom. If I had married the first person I slept with, I would have married Wayne Trotter. I never would have gone sock skating with Hank on the linoleum of our first studio apartment. I would have missed the way he tosses and turns the night before Flag Day. The pride I felt the first time he used one of my shirts as a rag. What I like about this speech is that Peggy is mentioning non-sexual things in her happiest moments with Hank. She loves the little things that may seem mundane, but she admires him for it. But Hank isn't having it anyway. Peggy, you coming to the wedding or not? The only reason I ask is I need to know how many burgers to defrost. Luann, however, seems to take it to heart. The next morning, Hank and Luann arrive at the park, and Hank points out that no one has arrived, even Rhett. Luann admits that she canceled the wedding. She finally understands what Peggy meant, that she was only getting married so it wouldn't be considered a sin to sleep with Rhett. But you and Aunt Peggy are the ones who should be fornicating. What if Reverend Stroop heard you talking like that? A Reverend Stoop thinks so, too. Chap, chap, Hank, let's go. I'm getting cold in here. It's now revealed that Peggy has opted to take the born-again virgin pledge for Hank. So, wait, Luann got all dressed up, told everyone, including Rhett, that the wedding was canceled, and got Peggy and the Reverend to set this entire thing up by the next morning? Talk about dedication. I suppose this makes up for outing Peggy's entanglement with Wayne to Hank. <laughs> I'm a virgin! Quick side note, Peggy looks good with her hair like that. But Hank comes to understand the absurdity of the whole thing. Sorry, Reverend, but a few churchy words and a dunk in the lake doesn't change it. But Hank becomes distracted by the wind. Uh, uh, Peggy, I, I can see your hot knots. And Hank enters the water with his shoes on to sweep her off her feet. Peggy tells Hank they can just start over, and that there won't be any secrets, and we get an adorable closing line from Luann. I think someone's going to lose her virginity. Not me. No, no. And Peggy. And you apparently sometime later, since you got pregnant by Lucky. The end. So we have two distinct instances of lying from both Hank and Peggy with these episodes. Hank's lie and Peggy's lie by omission. And while I don't want to paint it as if one is worse than the other because lying is lying, in the context of these two episodes, are either Hank or Peggy's reactions justified? I'm going to go with yes and mostly yes. I do think Hank is more in the wrong. The truth of the actual events of him missing Valentine's Day wasn't even just known to him, it was known to several people, including his closest friends. Dale is even actively trying to cover for Hank, which also makes me wonder how many people in the school really knew about it since Hank was on the football team and word travels fast. Then again, Hank and Peggy went to different schools. Peggy, it was over 20 years ago. No, no, sir. It was just yesterday that we told Luann the story of how your bad back saved our relationship, do you remember? And that means you have been lying every single day since high school. That is thousands and thousands of lies. And this is the crux of the argument of where I think Hank is more in the wrong. Because what Peggy is saying is true. This wasn't something that was mentioned and dealt with once 20 years ago like Peggy's fling. It was something that was actively lied about up until the present day. Even if Hank seemed hesitant to speak about the Valentine's Day story, he still went with it and kept treating it as fact. 
It would have been one thing to come clean years later, maybe sit down with Peggy and tell her the truth. It wouldn't be pleasant, but Hank should know that every time he recounts the story with her, he's lying again. The lie becomes fresh once more, but Peggy found out the truth on her own, and she also had to grasp at the realization that he was comfortable enough with lying to her all those years. When you come to such a revelation, it does make you question everything, so her reaction to the truth is understandable. Well, which mistake is that? Sleeping with him, not sleeping with me, or lying about it for 20 years? Now here's where I'm going to start dealing in technicalities when it comes to Peggy. From what I'm seeing in this episode, Peggy didn't seem to outright say she was a virgin when she got with Hank. She just seemed the most adamant at waiting until marriage. Hank likely assumed that was the case because of how young they were. Maybe she did off screen, but I'll just take what we're seeing at face value. So was Peggy technically lying if she didn't tell Hank? Perhaps not. However, it's clear that Hank understood that to be the case when they got together and even such in the present day. If Peggy wants to be virtuous, she should have told Hank the truth when she understood he believed she was a virgin when they got together. My guess, given the context, is that it just wasn't brought up when Hank and Peggy were dating. They were young and they got together and Hank, being Hank, usually believes that the world should think like he does. So Hank believed Peggy was like him and hadn't slept with anyone at that time. The fact that Peggy was so adamant they wait probably just solidified that belief, so he didn't bother to ask. Peggy's insistence was also explained here. I was wrong and I did not want to make the same mistake twice. She didn't want to just sleep with someone she didn't know for sure she wanted to be with. That's why she wanted to wait until she was married. Now, there are differing opinions on whether or not one should disclose the number of previous partners one has had before entering a relationship. Personally, I don't think one has to, but if it were me, then yes, I would like to know. For some, it doesn't matter. For others, it does. In Hank's case, it clearly did, and I appreciate Peggy didn't go for the excuse that it was none of his business. Because while that is technically correct and that would be the end of it, she acknowledges the fact that she lied to Hank by omission. This is evidenced by the fact she ate the other Hershey kiss and never corrected Hank. He only found out because someone else told him. I'm sorry, but Luann is such a brat for doing that. The fact that Peggy still tried hard to look out for her does give her a boost in good character points. Fight me. I do like that at the end of the episode, Hank decides to let it go because he succumbs to his own attraction for her. Perhaps understanding that he's only human and has the same desires as anyone else. So all is forgiven, including the whole charcoal thing. These two episodes encapsulate the fact that the truth will always come out. Maybe not in a day, week, or even years, but it does come out. Hank outright lied while Peggy lied by omission. Granted, Hank and Peggy's relationship wasn't predicated on the fact that she was a virgin, but rather her cooking ability, as was implied. I know you may think I'm being a bit softer on Peggy, but I'm not. Just because I'm dealing with technicalities here, Peggy still allowed her own lie to continue since she knew Hank's belief to be inaccurate. She had ample opportunity to set the record straight, but chose not to. And she didn't even have the excuse to set a good example for Luann since she was the one to find out in the first place. Hank himself lied from the start, and it seemed to be a well-known enough secret since even his friends knew the truth. He continued to lie in the present day. And I can understand to a certain extent Hank's reasoning in that after enough time it just may not be worth mentioning, he seemed pretty adamant that Peggy wouldn't find out. But I find that silly, because if she found out he really had mono instead of a hurt back, then why wouldn't she want to find out what else was false? These episodes have satisfying resolutions that mistakes can be forgiven and that we can all do better. I think Mr. Boomhauer said it best. Tough time don't take for me, man. It don't life too short, man. You don't want to hold no grudge, man. I thought maybe you gonna let little bygones be bygones, man. All in all, the biggest takeaway here is the old adage. Honesty is the best policy. It may hurt to be truthful, but what is worse? Telling the truth or being found out to be a dirty, dag, nasty liar after the truth comes out. Just don't lie, people. It puts you and others in a bad way, and the truth will always come out. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Harvey McLeod, and I'm here to make videos for you. And I'll see y'all next time. Bye bye And Hank enters the water with his shoes on to sweep her off her feet. Stupid motorcycle! So we have two distinct instances of phone call. 
Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Airplane!